Thank you. And also thank you, Denise, Andre, and all the organizers for such a great initiative. I'm really happy to join you today. So my name is Elvira Shishenina. I'm a quantum computer research scientist at Total, a French multinational energy company. So having a purely academical classical background, I surely can't probably, for instance, consider myself as, a, as an expert in the quantum computing. So everything I'm, what I'm going to speak today about is um, entirely subjective and based mostly on my experience and vision of things. But I sincerely hope that it could be helpful for someone who have already started or just thinking about to start this transition from academy to industry and from classical to quantum. So I will give you a long preface, just want to uh, give a couple of words about my background. So I did my first master in mathematics in Russia, in Novosibir State University in the middle of Siberia. <laughs> so this school is a part of Russian Academy of Science and the education there is, I would say, purely fundamental, same as the departments like pure math, chemistry, biology, physics, informatics, and others. So what is interesting is that even if in my mathematical department we had pretty good ratio between girls and boys, it was a complete failure for the physical one. So you can see. And no one actually posed the questions why this is so. And we didn't really know why this physical faculty is so much unattractive for girls. It was just like that. But of course, we had certain like internal jokes or stereotypes such that, for example, if you are very, very smart, you should go do physics. If you are less smarter, you should probably go do maths or chemistry. And if you are not smart at all, I won't continue just in order to not offend anyone. But I guess you, you got the idea behind. So, yeah, there was such a mystery behind this physical faculty. And I think it could potentially affect many people and especially the fewer students who would like to join this faculty. And that would, could degrade this situation to even worse. And also, I think that probably it could be at the origin of this, let's say, such natural um, disbalance or stereotype, but the door to the quantum computer lays through the deep understanding of the quantum mechanics, which I would say nowadays is not completely true because we have already entered to the engineering phases of the quantum computing, which is much more larger in terms of the required competencies. So after the University State University, I moved to France to Ecole Polytechnique in order to do some applied education. So Ecole Polytechnique is quite old school. It was founded in the Napoleon period and very famous by its multidisciplinary education school. So even if it has more than 200 years history, the first women integrated it in 1972. And we were seven for almost half thousand person promotion. But what is fun is that one of them actually got the best grades uh, among the whole promotion at the same year. So now the statistic, as you see, is much more sympathetic. In my year, this ratio was around 12 persons. And now I guess it's something around 16, 17. So very positive dynamics. So keep going. I go for the technique. I'm very proud of you. Yeah, and after I continue my thesis in, in RIA, it's a French uh, National Research Institute in Informatics and Athematics in the team project Magic 3D. And um, I worked mostly on the development of a numerical method for solving partial differential equations for physical process modeling. And in particular, in my cases, it was the elastic acoustic wave propagation. So that's when I got, I guess, like being practically before every time involved into the academical world where I got the first frustration because when you develop a numerical method, it can be very perfect on the paper. But when you try to consider it in the context of the industrial problem or real data scale, it completely fails because it becomes very expensive and practically useless. So in my case, the biggest problem was the inversion of sparse matrices. And when it's when I get started, to, I started to get interested into the quantum computing and in particular in the applications uh, to the linear algebra. And the first one, for example, for me was uh, the famous HHL algorithm for solving the linear systems of equations. So that's how I, uh, yeah. And what was very exciting for me in that period is that 
For example, you can try to identify this most expensive part and inefficient part in your large classical algorithm and try to replace it by the quantum simulation and probably got something much faster and in the best case, more precise and to allow to yourself a larger range of the potential applications. So that's how I got this transition, let's say, to the quantum computing. And that's also how I integrated the quantum computing project and total in order to continue to explore this idea and also to discover some of other potential applications. So when you pass through this sort of transition, the main question by you pose yourself, I think it's, I mean, not only for me, but I think it's something common is what are the main competencies that you need to acquire? And that was also, also the question that I discussed with the HR specialist during my recruitment process. So who is the best problem solver? Someone who has the very deep competencies into in the quantum computing and probably zero or very few knowledges in the in the domain specifics, or someone who is a specialist in the domain and probably without any basic knowledges in the quantum computing. So tell me if I'm wrong, but I noticed this tendency in the academia that sometimes we quantum computing scientists we try to solve the problem in let's say more fundamental and general way. But sometimes when you know some of the physical context of a problem and any specific characteristics on this problem, it could help you to create much more adaptive technique for the certain type of the application. So going back to the partial differential equation, I want to give you the example. So when you try to solve the, um, the partial differential equation, um, by choosing the special type of space discretization for your duration operator, you can reduce your initial continuous problem to solving the linear system. And thanks to this special type discretization, your linear system will be represented by the matrix, which is in this case A, which is real number. And also you can make it symmetrical. And if you will divide it by trace, you will obtain exactly the density matrix. And believe me that in the quantum computing to invent the algorithm for solving linear system with a density matrix is much, much more easier than for any other random sparse matrix. So this is just without giving you more details, just to understand, just to let you understand that here we hundred persons in the zone of expertise of classical specialists. And this is what could be probably much more interested in the, for the industrial companies, which who are more uh, result oriented, I would say. And of course, for them, it will take um, a certain time to develop these both competencies and especially to integrate their, uh, to educate their specialists. But at least at this initial stage, I think the, the main goal would be to ensure, to ensure that these both competencies, we can communicate, we can collaborate, share, and also speak the common language. So if you can see on this diagram, I added also the third dimension, which corresponds to the quantum hardware. So at the beginning of your race on the best quantum hardware provider, the most, I would say, popular opinion among the software developers was like, um, let's stay as much as we can hardware agnostic until the best quantum hardware technology will prove itself. Now we can see that there are many groups, big groups, and also the small startups that um, produce the hardware technology and that start to fill the market and occupy the different segments, um, providing their special products with a special type of architecture, but also the small showcases and like toy examples in order to highlight the advantages of each special type of architecture. So for example, speaking about the quantum annealing and, and adiabatic quantum computing, for example, it's the binary optimization. Uh, optical neural networks and communication goes to for the photonics quantum computing. And also there are some sampling problems which can be efficiently solved, for example, on the Rydberg cold atom based uh, architecture and for example, chemistry for super, superconducting, et cetera, et cetera. So this is just for to give you an example and to say that probably in order to create more adaptive uh, application or approach, you should not only take into account the specific of a domain, but also take advantage of the choice of the architecture in order to create more 
application oriented and architecture adapted algorithm. And this opened actually huge perspectives for a huge range of specialists in order to, to integrate this quantum computing world because every, com every competency and every expertise, whatever is a soft, is a hardware or is a problem specific matters. And in continuity of this idea, I found this phrase, I unfortunately couldn't track the origin because there, are, there were many modifications that happiness is not the absence of the problems, it's the ability to deal with them. I want to propose as well my modifications that is not the absence of problems, but when you solve the problems that you really love to solve. So the quantum computing domain, even if it's still relatively young, it's so much transversal and you can choose where and how you can apply your skills, what problems to solve and make this domain useful for you, but also your competencies and skills useful for the entire quantum computing itself. So I think at least it should inspire many people. And that's actually what inspired me also in, in when I integrated Total. Oof. So <laughs> when I joined with Total's quantum computing project, we were literally two in the project. It was me and the scientific expert, Henri Calandra, who practically launched this project and who bring the first, I, uh, the first vision to this project. So this vision was quite pragmatic and pretty clear is that internally in total, we don't really have any expertise in the quantum computing, but we really want to integrate this technology and especially to understand this technology. So we will learn it by developing. We will communicate with different experts internally and externally in order to identify the problems that could be potentially uh, talkable by the quantum computing. And also we will collaborate with the strongest in order to learn from them. And we will supervise, the, we pitch the students and then employ them. And like that, we will build our internal competencies. We will grow our team who will be able to, to solve the problems which are oriented toward the specific use cases of TOTO. So that was, from the beginning, that was very exciting period because usually when you integrate the project, the story is already in run and uh, um, but when I joined the Totals project, it was at the really early stage. So um, I could have this chance not only to research and develop, but also to communicate, to explore, to supervise, to learn, etc. So it was the period of the first development when I, I implemented the first codes, made the first application libraries. And also when we built the first collaboration, employed the first students and um, yeah, and propose the first, for example, specific use case for solving. So currently in total, I'm on charge of research and development in the domain of linear algebra. So it's uh, PDS, uh, linear system solving and everything related to a state preparation, how to efficiently encode your classical data and criteria. Um, also the quantum, chem quantum chemistry. And this is where we, I think, got the most the biggest progress. So it started with the development of the two solvers. So from the beginning, we identified them to a uh, variational quantum eigen solver and imaginary time evolution. So later, it was their benchmarking study of the scalability optimization. And um, also uh, what I'm most proud of is that we could identify the use case on the carbon capture by adsorption. Um, together with the expert from Total CC US department. And we happily study it today together with the chemistry team from Cambridge Quantum Computing, because these guys, they have this vision, which we share in particular that we should keep an eye, uh, not only on the quantum technology itself in order to move forward in exploring the potential applications, but on, also on the classical techniques, which could help to us to prepare our initial problems. So for example, in Cambridge quantum computing, they have not only a lot of expertise on this, but they already have the, the implemented classical techniques. And that's where we converged. We think that we should merge quantum and classical um, in order to create more hybrid approaches in, in order to move towards more complicated use cases. Yeah, so um, now I want to speak a bit more generally in 
what actually makes industries to invest in the quantum computing technologies and in particular how the industrial company can capitalize on the quantum computing technology now. So first of all, it's because the industrial companies, they have these problems to solve faster, more efficient in order to preserve resources, money, time spent, etc. But regarding the actual stage of the quantum hardware, I think it's more or less long-term goal, but it doesn't mean at all that we shouldn't invest in this technology now in order to identify the problematics, prepare them, make the first proof of concepts in order to estimate the time, the resources, and also the choice of the collaborators and to see how we can be solved in order to show the advantage. And also it will help them to be uh, up to date to the, best uh, to the best technologies and how to say, integrate more efficiently this project into the ecosystem of the company. And the third one, which is I find also important is the communication because the scientific communication was historically predicated on the uh, uh, knowledge deficit model. And I will explain you what is it. So now the quantum computing domain is relatively young yet, and we have a huge lack of knowledge in the society. So every information that you communicate actually is literally absurd by the society, and it propagates much faster and much fewer than any other information. And in the most of cases, even without any critical filters. So I think it's responsibility, not only the big actors in the domain of quantum computing, but also like each individual in order to, to make the communication proper, more honest, more pragmatic, and to not create these waves of hype, what we can observe now. Because practically what we see now, the progress in the quantum computing and the result that we have now, it, they are impressive itself already compared to what we had, for example, 10 years ago. So when we try to sell them better, it sort of undervalue these results and make this domain probably not that much attractive for our people. So this is also that can be considered as a challenge in order to integrate this technology into the company. There are many other challenges, and in particular that this disruptive technology and the disruptive technologies in general we are quite limited, and especially because the sure use case, which will 100% work, uh, sometimes doesn't exist. And that's why it requires for companies completely different return on investment policy and criteria. And as a result, a huge responsibility because, well, let's say quantum computing technology is not the cheapest one, especially. So that's why this type of technology is disruptive technology. They are usually integrated into the company by the senior level management in order to reduce all the skepticism um, of more junior staff and also to be able to support this responsibility. I don't want to stop on this because I have so much to tell you, but I just want to propose you one book which called uh, The Innovator's Dilemma. It's quite old one, but I think it's still actual. It explains exactly how the process of adoption of the disruptive technology by the company, which was always based uh, on the sustainable model of business happens and why in the most of case, it's like highway to failure. <laughs> yeah, and going back to the communication, there is one more reading that I didn't mention here. Uh, is on the uh, uh, deficit and dial dialogue. Uh, so it explains the, uh, the deficit model of science communication actually by Simon J. Locke um, from uh, University College of London. Very, very nice reading, very easy one actually, and it helps you to understand many things. So regarding the integration strategy, uh, I could probably, well, it won't be discovering for you, but I think there are two main of them, but we could, probably can be complementary as well. So get the hands dirty and uh, let specialists do their job. And they both have their advantages and risks that I try to uh, represent here. So regarding the second one, sometimes the companies, we are a bit scared to invest heavily into the research and we want to have this 
flexibility, let's say, if technology doesn't work to retract themselves from, from this investment and from this engagement. And that's why we prefer to send the problems directly to the companies who are much more specialized on solving such type of problems and then to pay them and then to get back the results. But there is always this risk is that um, you don't really have an access to the science. So once you modify slightly your problem, you will have to pay twice in order to, to, to run it again. And also before paying, you should also know what are you paying for. So, so it will definitely requires at least the presence of experts or probably external experts who could estimate this involvement, this engagement and the spend of, of resources. And here is where academia actually can help. So there are many differences between academy industry and industry uh, in terms of research. So for example, in industry, some of the discoveries that were done in the quantum computing from the academical point of view, we, we, uh, we were not in the noticed. And the same in academia, as I told you, there is this tendency to solve the problem in more general way, sometimes without regarding this, the physical context and also the scale of the problem. So how to accelerate this transition between of the competencies between academy and industry, because it could definitely improve the speed of the progress of the domain itself. So now you can see that this room, this transition room is quite empty, but there are already many like small companies or initiatives like think tanks um, and small startups uh, who specialized on resources and career, etc who start to appear in the in the market, in the in the domain, and they occupy the segments, the different segments. So it's actually a very good way in order to um, introduce the both worlds together, also by doing networks, networking, creating the communities, and also doing the conferences, webinars, summer school, and also this is, could be helpful as well is to make the resources available because when we have like the access for the free platforms and free tutorials in order to play ourselves and to 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 get the uh, to to get know the domain from the inside, this is totally cool and I think can inspire many people as well. Also, there is a huge question of employment: how to efficiently find the, the competencies that you are really need. Um, especially it's a big question for students as well, how to find the internship, how to communicate with employees, et cetera, et cetera. So for example, this is a domain of expertise of Cureka. And also with some alumni of the, uh, of the Cold Polytechnic, we found that the Quantix is the association uh, uh, which involves the alumni of the Cold Polytechnic who are related to quantum computing technology like researchers, uh, investors, industrial groups, in order to put them together and to facilitate their communication. And of course, Laura, I'm yeah. sorry I have to interrupt, but we have a timing issue. So let's get to the yeah. last slide and then. Oh, this was the last slide, actually. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Really sorry. So uh, just to finish, the quantum computing is a totally place of diversity for diversity because it's a, in, in all the sense, actually, not only gender one. Um, because it's a growing domain with a huge potential in the entrance cost is still low because no one will at this stage ask you like 10 years of experience, but they more likely will estimate you your potential to apply, to interact and to learn. So many resources are available, so don't be shy to educate yourself. It is impressively transversal and many segments are not yet filled. And don't forget about the honest communication. And the last I would like to say is that um, now we have many clusters and, community, and communities um, and uh, we have a lot of different fluctuations, but more global norms and patterns are not yet uh, defined in the domain of the quantum computing. So it's of us, of people who are already involved in this domain to, to create these new norms and to make the quantum computing a place for diversity in the future. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.